Okay, so today we are going to be looking at Laboratory 8, which concerns three experiments covering gas behavior and the ideal gas law. So in this experiment, we are going to look, be looking at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to determine the mass percent of hydrogen peroxide in this solution. So first and foremost, we are going to measure the amount of hydrogen peroxide by decomposing the hydrogen peroxide using yeast, which contains the catalase enzyme, which facilitates the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to oxygen gas. So by measuring the volume of collected oxygen gas, we are in turn going to be able to calculate the mass of hydrogen peroxide and the mass percent of hydrogen peroxide in our solution. So first things first, we have to assemble a gas collection apparatus, okay? So first things first, we are gonna take our rigid tubing and our stopper with a hole and now it's really important that you don't push. You're just using a twisting motion, just a gentle twisting motion. No pushing. Your hand is never touching the edge. You're just twisting clockwise. And it, by, by torque, it will eventually go in. Make sure that your hand is neither in the, in the front or the back of your glass tube and make sure that you don't bend your glass tube substantially. Just, just a nice gentle twisting motion. And it takes a little bit of time, don't worry. Just a nice gentle twisting motion. Be careful not to break glassware or push. We're just twisting. And from the twisting motion, we're generating torque, which in turn drives our glass through the stopper. Don't get impatient. You don't want to hurt yourself. And just a nice torquing, twisting motion not bending, just a turning motion. And remember, you don't want your hands in front or behind the tube in case it breaks. So let's finish this process up. So you should end up with something that looks like this by the, if you're making progress. Let's keep going just a little bit more. Okay. 
Here we go. Let's do just a little bit more. Remember, you're using a twisting motion, not a push. Okay, so we have the following setup prepared. That's going to go on top of our Erlenmeyer. Okay, so we'll leave that off to the side for now. So let's prep the rest of our setup. Let's prep the rest of our setup. So what we're going to do, making sure again, you have your goggles and gloves on. You're then going to take your flexible tubing and we're going to carefully, we're going to carefully, just like we did before, one moment, let me just adjust the camera really quickly. We're going to carefully twist the flexible tubing onto the top of our rigid tubing, just with a twisting motion, no pushing, just a twist. You don't want to break the glass. Here we go. So now we have our flexible tubing on our rigid tubing. Let's twist it a little bit more. Okay. So now we're going to now we have our flexible tubing set up on top of our Erlenmeyer flask, on top of our rigid tubing. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the end of our flexible tubing and we're going to bend it. We're going to bend the end of our flexible tubing into a U shape and we're going to use a rubber band to hold it in place. Let me adjust the camera once again. So we're going to keep the flexible tubing. Let me do another repetition, another circle with the rubber band. Okay. A few more circles should do the trick. So we're going to take the end of our flexible tubing and we're going to wrap it. There we go. So now the end of our flexible tubing is bent into a U shape. Here we go. So we have our U shape. It's going to go into our four into our 600 mil Erlenmeyer flask filled with about 400 mils of water. And now this is the part where it's a little bit tricky. You're going to then take your 100 
milliliter graduated cylinder and you're going to fill it above the 100 mark Okay, so we filled it above our 100 mark. And now what we're going to do, and I'd recommend you fill it almost all the way to the top. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cover the cap. So we're gonna cover the top of our graduated cylinder. And we're gonna very carefully, gonna very carefully immerse it into our flask, I mean, into our beaker. Now make sure that you don't take your fingers off until it's fully in to the flask, I mean, fully into your beaker. Then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to secure the graduated cylinder using our ring clamp. So the, the book procedure calls for you to use your, your ring, but I, I personally think it would be better for, for security just to clamp the graduated cylinder makes it a little bit operationally easier too. So we'll clamp our graduated cylinder. There we go. So now we have our graduated cylinder clamped and it has a large volume of water in our cylinder. We'll make sure to write down the volume of air that we have stuck in our cylinder before gas collection, followed by the volume after gas collection. So just to check in, does everyone have this gas collection setup almost completely prepared. There's one more step that we need to use and then we're all set to go. So as our final step, you're gonna take your gas collection outlet, you're gonna take your gas collection outlet and you're very carefully making sure your graduated cylinder is always open under the water you're going to very carefully move your gas collection outlet get this set up so it's a little bit easier. There we go. There we go. So you're gonna wanna make sure that your tubing is fully immersed so that the outlet is fully immersed inside your graduated cylinder. And then you can clamp your entire setup securely. And there we go. So we have our tubing, the opening is going inside our graduated cylinder. We have our graduated cylinder We'll record the volume of water in our graduated cylinder. 
And now all we have to do is prep our actual yeast for the reaction. So can I get some confirmations in the chat that everyone's about at this stage in their procedure if you're following along? Was everyone able to get to this step in their procedure? Wait, how did you put the flexible tubing in the graduated cylinder? Oh, under the water, I just very quickly push the, the flexible tubing inside the graduated cylinder. So the end of our flexible tubing, which is about right here, is inside the graduated cylinder. Does that make sense? So under the water, you're just threading it in. As long as the end of your flexible tubing is inside the opening of your graduated cylinder, you're good to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just taking a while. Yeah, it's a, it's a little tricky doing it under the water, but um, it's okay. So just to show this process step by step one more time, just to show this process step by step one more time, if you're starting this from scratch. So you'd fill your graduated cylinder. Then you'd place both of your fingers above the cap and you'd invert the graduated cylinder into a container of deionized water. This one's a no-go. Got too much, so let's try again. So we put both our fingers over the cap and then we quickly invert it into our container. Perfect. Still not good. I still need to do a little bit better job. It's hard getting a good seal. Don't worry, you can just keep trying again. I recommend overfilling your graduated cylinder to make it easier in the inverting step. We put both our fingers over and then we very quickly invert it into the opening. Okay, so we don't have a large volume of air this time. Then what you're going to do is you're gonna very carefully You're going to very carefully thread your flexible tubing into the opening of your graduated cylinder and it should stick in the opening with no issues whatsoever. Then you're going to clamp your graduated cylinder There we go. 
So now everything's clamped, our graduated cylinder is secure. And as you notice, we have a relatively small volume of air in our graduated cylinder. So we're now ready to continue on with the next few stages of our experiment. So the first thing that we're gonna to need to do, the first thing that we're gonna to need to do is we're going to need to very quickly take down the temperature of our setup. So we'll measure the temperature of our water right now. So we're gonna get out our thermometer. And what we're gonna do is we're going to place it into our water and we'll record the temperature of our water. This will be the same as the temperature of our oxygen gas that we collect. In this case, the temperature of our water was recorded to be 20.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, the atmospheric pressure you're gonna get from the, the local regional pressure. And the atmospheric pressure should be around one atmosphere, but we'll look up the atmospheric pressure at the end of this lab. Okay, so we finished recording the temperature of our water. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna get the yeast all set up. Now it's really important, it's really important that you do not kill your yeast. It's a living organism and it needs a certain temperature of water to function. So we're gonna get our hydrogen peroxide and yeast ready to go. So in order to do that, first and foremost, we are going to get warm water at 45 degrees Celsius. So give me one moment. I'm going to go get warm water and we'll resume in about two minutes. So I'm going to get the warm water for the yeast. Uh, warm tap water is okay for the, the yeast. Um, the warmed deionized water would be preferred. And it needs to be at least 45 degrees Celsius and we'll check that with our thermometer. If you mix cold water with the yeast, you'll kill it and the reaction won't go as efficiently. So I'll get the warm water and I'll be back momentarily. So let's, let me just check the temperature of warm water that I got. Here we go. So here's our warm water 
at about 46 to 47 degrees Celsius. So I can mix it with my yeast. So I'm, I'm gonna open up my container of baker's yeast and I will mix the baker's yeast with my water. Make sure the water is not too warm or cold or the yeast will just die and then it won't facilitate a reasonable reaction. Enzymes in the yeast, known as one enzyme known as the catalase enzyme, is responsible Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're gonna mix the water and the yeast together. It's almost like we're, we're making a bread starter. And again, we need to make sure the water is warm, otherwise the yeast will just die off and we wouldn't have an efficient reaction. So if anyone ever bakes bread, this should look like a familiar process. Okay, and now what we're going to do, what we're going to do next is we'll have our yeast water on the side. We're gonna get out our balance. and we're gonna tear our graduated cylinder on the balance, okay? So we have our graduated cylinder teared on the balance. And now what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're gonna very carefully transfer five milliliters of our hydrogen peroxide solution. And we'll make sure to record the mass of our hydrogen peroxide solution for our later mass percent calculations. Okay, and we'll leave and cap our hydrogen peroxide. Now, double checking. We have five milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. And to check the mass of our hydrogen peroxide, here is the mass of our hydrogen peroxide solution that we are using for this experiment. We need, of course, the mass of our solution to calculate the mass percent. So we have 5.1 grams of hydrogen peroxide solution. Okay, we'll set our balance off to the side and cap our balance. And now we're gonna pour this hydrogen peroxide into our reaction Erlenmeyer flask. Okay. 
we'll make sure the cap is securely connected. Now, we've already set up our graduated cylinder and we've inserted our U-shaped tubing and we've secured our graduated cylinder. Now, what we are going to do, what we are going to do is we are going to record, oops, let me adjust this. So now we are going to record the initial volume of air in our graduated cylinder, which in this case, So our initial volume of air is at the is at the five milliliter mark on our graduated cylinder. So our initial volume is five point zero milliliters. Okay. I apologize if it's hard to make the reading directly. Um, let me try one more time with a more clear background. Let's try with another background. Oh, it's not much better. Okay, so it's about, it's at the five milliliter line. So that's our initial volume of air. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our graduated cylinder and we're going to rinse it with deionized water. We want to make sure that it's completely clean before this next step. Otherwise, we will see some very annoying side reactions or not, or we would see excess oxygen gas being generated. We want to make sure there's no hydrogen peroxide still sitting around in our graduated cylinder. And now as the yeast is warm, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to transfer five milliliters of our yeast solution that we've carefully prepared in warm water into our reaction Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, so we have our five milliliters of yeast all set up and ready to go. And now what we're going to do is you're gonna pour the yeast into your Erlenmeyer flask and you're gonna make sure it's capped because you're gonna see a pretty dramatic, a pretty dramatic take reaction take place. Okay, so we're gonna uncap our setup is secure. We recorded our initial volume. Let's now mix these solutions and then cap our flask. And then with stirring, as we begin to see, our mixture is bubbling and we are generating oxygen gas from the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Now, of course, this setup isn't perfect. There, there's inherently some air bubbles trapped in our tubing, um, but it's Ooh, pretty good. Professor? Yes. Did we take the temperature of the distilled H2O yet? Yes. Uh, the temperature was found to be 20.6. And we can measure it again at the end of this experiment as well. So for those following along with their own lab kit, is everyone going doing okay so far? Is everyone seeing the bubbles form?
Now, throughout this experiment, you're going to make sure that you swirl the Erlenmeyer floss to facilitate the reaction. And you're going to continue to swirl the mixture periodically until no bubbles are generated. Yep. So in terms of when we started this reaction, we started it at roughly 138. So as we notice already, we have generated a substantial amount of oxygen gas. We have generated, we went from five mils to almost 55. So we've generated almost 50 milliliters of oxygen gas already. And this is really showcasing a pretty interesting idea about gases. A small number of moles or molecules of gas particles can have a very large volume. Again, you'll con you'll, you'll, you should continue to shake and stir your Erlenmeyer flask to facilitate the reaction and generate additional oxygen gas. So we'll keep going for and keep stirring it for about another 10 to 15 minutes or until we stop seeing bubbles form. Here, if I stir it, I still see bubbles. So how's everyone's experiment going? Is everyone seeing something similar in their run? Are things going okay in their run? Can I get some feedback in the chat or? Okay, perfect. I see some students are seeing about the same result. There aren't any leaks. If you have an abnormally small amount of gas, there's likely a leak in your setup. Um, but otherwise, you should get in the ballpark of 60 to 70 milliliters. So I'm going to continue to stir my mixture and generate additional gas. So we'll allow this reaction to continue. And make sure to stir your mixture. If you use properly warm water, then this reaction should go pretty quickly. So continuing to stir our solution, I'm not seeing any additional bubbles. So I'm gonna put the stop time at 1.43. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the volume, the final volume inside my I'm going to record the final volume inside my graduated cylinder. Okay, 
Now it's important that you don't move anything when you do this. You'll record the final volume exactly as is. So let's zoom in on our setup and let's record the final volume. So looking at the final volume, reading from the bottom of the meniscus at eye level, I see a final volume of about 97.2 mils. Professor, could you repeat that one more time? Yep. So reading off from the bottom of the meniscus, I see my final volume is about 97.2. As we're past, well, now it's not quite there. Let me let me give it another stir just to. So after drawing out the additional drawing out some additional bubbles. Our final volume looks to be about 99.5 milliliters. So just to repeat that, our final volume is about 99.5 milliliters. Okay. So now that we, the initial volume was five mils. Yep, 5.0 to be exact. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna take apart this setup and we're gonna dispose of our solutions. So that concludes our data collection for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Um, and we'll continue on with the next part of this gas law lab set.